Okay, let's get started. So, uh, thanks so much for connecting. Uh, appreciate your time. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh, the purpose of uh, today's presentation is a discussion of a comparative review of pharmacoeconomic guidelines in, in South Africa. Uh, I'm Jean Kirapinha. I'm a market access scientist uh, at CNC. And uh, the presentation that I'll be talking about uh, today is based on a paper that was uh, recently published in the Journal of Medical Economics. Um, so this is the, the one um, early in August. Uh, and it was a discussion of, a again, a comparative review of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines um, in South Africa. And um, it compared the South African guidelines to a number of different countries. Um, and this presentation will take us um, over, take you over the, um, uh, the details uh, of the, the paper um, and also uh, present uh, a couple of uh, points for, for further thought uh, in terms of potential updates in the, the future to the, the guidelines. Uh, just in, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, the, the Journal of Medical Economics, um, I serve as an editorial board member. Um, they are based in, in London, part of the, the Taylor and Francis group. Um, but um, I assure you that the, uh, the, the rigor and the peer review process that uh, applies to any author also applies to editorial board members. Um, so this paper went through a rigorous peer review process. Um, just like um, every other author, um, despite uh, me being an editorial board member. So, um, like I mentioned, um, by the end of the, this presentation, um, we'll be emailing a copy of the, the PDF um, to you, um, if you don't already have it, um, so that you have a personal copy for your use. Um, if you only have um, five minutes uh, to connect uh, on the webinar today, um, um, then... Um, then I thought that uh, a good place to, to start is uh, perhaps the, the conclusion. So if you only have five minutes, and I'm going to only present the, the two concluding slides, and then the rest of the, the presentation, will, which will be about um, 20 minutes, will be a discussion of uh, how did um, uh, we get to these concluding remarks. So if one looks at the, the pharmacoeconomic guidelines uh, in South Africa, is that they differ um, in significant ways uh, compared to uh, guidelines uh, across the, the world. And um, I picked uh, 12 countries in, in total to compare South Africa to six high-income countries, um, six middle-income countries, and South Africa's guidelines uh, appear to differ in, uh, in important areas, and, and I'll discuss those areas. Um, the concluding remarks related to this research is that um, establishing whether a medicine represents fair value for money may not be immediately achievable in South Africa given these differences that, that exist. And uh, I'm suggesting that future updates to the pharmacoeconomic guidelines um, include um, a couple of areas. So first is adopting a societal perspective with limitations, uh, which is uh, what a lot of high income and middle income countries, um, South Africa seems to have gone in the opposite opposite direction of adopting only a third party perspective, that is a perspective only of medical schemes. Um, the second future potential update is incentivizing complex and transparent models. Um, that is the, the preference of most um, high and middle income countries. Um, unlike in South Africa's pharmacoeconomic guidelines, there's a preference for simple models. And I'll discuss how we got to this conclusion. Integrating equity issues, um, um, all guidelines integrate uh, equity in the sense that um, any ISA, incremental cost effectiveness ratio that is developed uh, in a country applies equally to every single member of the, the population. Um, unfortunately, the South African guidelines only apply to the private sector. So any ISA that is developed um, only applies to the private sector and it ignores completely the rest of the, the population. And, and I'll discuss those equity issues. Um, other future updates include incentivizing uh, medical schemes to disclose reimbursement data. Uh, we know that this is not readily forthcoming um, from medical schemes and medical scheme administrators. Um, and I think there's a good opportunity here in the pharmacoeconomic guidelines to encourage the disclosure of those claims data um, to be used in analysis and also then to conduct a budget impact analysis. Is All countries um, around the world require the inclusion of a budget impact model. Uh, 
um, in the final um, health technology assessment which is sent to the regulatory agency um, but in South Africa this uh, budget impact analysis has been completely left off um, and it's the only country where this um, uh, gap exists um, and then also further research is needed on the impact of mandatory guidelines um, in South Africa they've been voluntary for a number of years this is comparable to what uh, has happened in Malaysia as well and also in, in Egypt um, however in an emerging market uh, context uh, there aren't any countries that have implemented mandatory guidelines except for Mexico um, and I think there's some lessons uh, to be learned in an emerging market uh, context regarding the implementation of a mandatory um, pharmacoeconomic guidelines um, part of the um, other concluding remarks is that uh, this research it only answers what the differences are between um, South Africa's guidelines and other countries. Um, it partially answers why these differences exist. So um, things such as quality gaps in pharmacoeconomic research and capacity. Uh, this is not a, a personal thought or, or a CNC thought uh, amongst the rest of the team. This is based on research uh, that is been done um, in South Africa and, and I'll talk to it um, in a few moments time and also the the structural focus only on the the private sector may explain why there are differences between South Africa's pharmacoeconomic guidelines and other countries what this research doesn't answer at all is how these differences came about um, and uh, these three points are may explain how these differences came about such as conflicts of interest um, in individuals that were part of the original drafting team of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines um, and I'll discuss those um, a little bit later on good technical governance and due diligence um, the administrative justice um, act in in South Africa and how the pharmacoeconomic guidelines could potentially articulate with that uh, and then also private versus public uh, conversations and the the topic of leadership um, and I'll get um, to that um, a little bit later. So if you only have five minutes uh, for today's webinar, those are the concluding remarks um, uh, that came out of the, the research. Uh, we'll share a PDF uh, with you, but the remaining of the presentation will now uh, walk you through how we got to these uh, concluding remarks uh, and to substantiate what we found. So the, the overall purpose of the, the research uh, which started uh, a couple of months ago was to compare South Africa's guidelines to that of other middle and high income countries. Um, it started as a passing interest um, because um, CNC was already doing substantial amount of work uh, amongst clients in South Africa. Uh, we were and so we familiar excuse me we familiarized ourselves with the the pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Um, CNC was then requested to do some work in Portugal so we looked at their pharmacoeconomic guidelines and we compared the two and we found that there were different so uh, we didn't really make much of those differences um, until we were requested to do some work in Egypt and if you took the Egyptian guidelines and compared it to South Africa again you one saw more or less see the same sort of differences um, and that's where the idea was born to expand this type of analysis to not only include Portugal and Egypt compared to South Africa but then include a representative mix of high income countries and middle income countries and compare the the key features of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines amongst these group of countries and identify if there are commonalities what are they and if there are differences what are are they and identify priority areas for further improvement so the methods um, that were applied um, the International Society of Pharmacoeconomics and Outcomes Research, um, they use a, or develop rather than publish, a comparative table of pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Their tables um, look something like this. It has a title and the year of the document, um, and there's affiliation of the authors that develop the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in each country, uh, disclosure statements, perspective, indication, target population, and a bunch of, of other details that are included. This is freely available, publicly available on their, their web page, and it's a very useful repository to benchmark the the progress of um, each country level guideline and benchmark it with uh, with other countries so we use that uh, that useful tool um, South Africa information at the, the time of drafting uh, this was not available but it did become available during the the course of uh, working on on this manuscript um, due to the work of uh, ISPO South Africa chapter and that information is now available um, also on their their web page 
But if one looks at um, only the summary table, it was insufficient. So what we also did is we downloaded and used um, the 12 uh, comparator country guidelines that are available um, here on our desktop uh, and on our server. Um, if you'd like to see a copy of those comparator uh, guidelines, um, please drop us an email and, and we'd be more than happy to share those um, guidelines with you. Um, these key features are updated on, on an annual basis by in-country professionals and also ISPO members and also staff members. They're responsible for ensuring that this is uh, kept up to date. Um, what we did is we developed this um, flowchart um, just to identify um, a group of countries. So there were uh, in total um, 21 countries that were eligible for further analysis. We broke that down into World Bank income classification. There were a total of 15 high income countries and a total of six middle income countries. We chose all six middle income countries to be included and those were Egypt, Brazil, Cuba, Colombia, Malaysia and Mexico. And then we took a random sample of the, the 15 high income countries and we included uh, Germany, Ireland, Norway, Portugal, New Zealand and the, the Netherlands. Um, so these were the, the final comparator countries, six um, high income and six middle income countries um, spread around the, the world um, all compared to South Africa. Um, moving on to the, the first uh, important uh, difference uh, is that of study perspective. Is uh, South Africa's guideline is only focused on the third party payer perspective. So it only focuses on private health insurance companies or, or the perspective of the, the medical scheme. And this has an important implication for the type of costs that are included into pharmacoeconomic evaluations. Um, in contrast, um, all high income countries require a societal perspective, which is a much broader perspective which takes indirect costs into account, productivity expenses as well as it relates to the entire economy. So for example, Portugal stipulates that the societal perspective should be disaggregated into a third party pay perspective, so they have both societal and the third party. And remember the third party here is not private health insurance companies or medical schemes in Portugal. Third party pay perspective here refers to the national health insurance um, system uh, in particular and then also the individual hospitals that are responsible for managing um, the uh, provision of services but then also the reimbursement um, for products and services that are offered by third-party payers, excuse me, third-party providers such as manufacturers, uh, hospital suppliers and, and others. Uh, Norway imposes some limitations on a societal perspective. Um, all um, middle income countries require a societal perspective. So South Africa is the only country in the sample of countries that we sampled um, that limited to only a private health insurance perspective. Um, a next observation is that the what this does is by implication the type of um, costs that are included in the third party pers payer perspective uh, is limited to only those in the private health insurance company so indirect costs should not be included in the submission um, so this is a direct quote from the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa um, unlike most um, high income countries such as Portugal and the Netherlands and Ireland that require both direct and also indirect costs to be separately listed Germany for example considers indirect costs with a health technology has a substantial impact on, on productivity. And if you look at um, all of the guidelines in high income countries, productivity is an important area um, because they acknowledge that the, the level of technology that is being introduced into the healthcare system is such that although the price may be high, the economic benefits that are delivered by the newer technologies are justified both by the direct costs that are um, reduced um, or averted or the indirect uh, costs that are um, minimized or maximized depending on the, the methodology that, that is used and, and in this instance when I was trying to maximize the productivity of each member of the population and his or her contribution towards the economy and this is what high income countries are looking for. So in Norway productivity gains and costs due to the treatment effect are, are not compulsory but they are recommended based on the methodology. All um, middle income countries 
Mexico, Brazil, Egypt, uh, Cuba, and Malaysia. They recommend the inclusion of both direct and indirect uh, medical costs. Uh, for example, Colombia, changes in productivity or costs or benefits in other sectors of society um, should be included. So um, again, here's an important difference in the sense that um, South Africa does not recommend the inclusion of indirect costs, uh, contrary to what is happening in high-income and also middle-income countries. Um, if one looks at um, the, the subject of economic modeling, is that the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa discourage the use of complex models. Um, it prefers simple models. And um, an application must be lodged um, by a submission developer, so the manufacturer, pharmaceutical company, biotech firm, generic manufacturer in South Africa, must be first lodged with the Department of Health prior to development of the full submission. So, so this is a type of a pre-approval of the model um, before the full pharmacoeconomic model um, is completed. And um, if one compares this type of pre-approval process for an economic model, South Africa is the, the only country that, uh, that does this. Um, all high-income countries permit the use of pharmacoeconomic modeling and emphasize that assumptions and data resource uh, sources be clearly documented so there, there isn't any form of a pre-approval um, process um, and they encourage that the an economic model should be appropriate to the research questions so um, not necessarily favoring simple or complex but it should be appropriate to answer the research question um, middle income countries also permit the use of pharmacoeconomic modeling so researchers in Brazil they have the flexibility to develop a model consistent with a primary research question which is what we saw also in high income countries the same thing in Mexico and Egypt and mathematical decision modeling in Colombia must include a description of the, the model so all the assumptions and the sources of information must be clearly stated. So um, in all middle-income countries and high-income countries, they are interested in the transparency of the, the model, but they don't include any form of a pre-approval before any further work can be done on the pharmacoeconomic submission. And um, having read the uh, PE guidelines in South Africa and compared them to other countries, um, I think um, it would be useful to disaggregate uh, uh, two related concepts. First is the complexity of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines and simplicity. And then on, on a different axis is the transparency versus uh, op opacity or opaqueness um, of the, the guidelines. Ideally, where we want to be um, in the, is in this quadrant over here, where we are developing complex and transparent guidelines. The, the complexity of these newer technologies that are being introduced in the areas of oncology, rare diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, obesity across the board. These are complex molecules, um, uh, complex technologies. Uh, their mechanisms of action are, are also complex. So the economic modeling and the result in clinical practice is also complex. So what we need to do is develop complex, appropriate, and transparent pharmacoeconomic guidelines that respond to the clinical practice um, locally uh, within South Africa. Um, it appears that the pharmacoeconomic guidelines at the moment have a preference for, for simple, uh, simple models. Uh, they don't discuss at all transparency or whether the, um, the uh, the model is opaque or, or not opaque. Um, it appears that the, the guidelines are focused here at the, the moment, and the, the paper that was published in the Journal of Medical Om uh, Economics motivates for a move from the simple state to a more complex state so that the true value of newer technologies, um, be it biologic or biosimilar, is truly appreciated in the full complexity that these newer technologies present um, to society. Um, another element uh, is the financial impact analysis. So pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa do not detail at all the need for a financial impact analysis, so the uh, budget impact modeling. Um, it is required in most uh, middle-income countries, Brazil, Cuba, Malaysia, and Mexico. Um, it is a requirement there. It's recommended in Egypt and, and Colombia. And in all um, high-income countries, uh, it is either required or recommended. And how it's used is, for instance, in Portugal, they want to know what the estimated impact is of introducing this new technology on the, the total public health care budget. Uh, in Germany, um, for instance, they want to ensure that, given that it's a social health insurance system, that it is affordable to German insurance. And how much more per month is it going to require for the state to pay for the inclusion of 
of this new technology on the formery, either for, for um, uh, well, for, depending on the other conditions. So it will be therapeutic class um, specific, indication specific, and they want to know precisely how much more the public um, healthcare budget is going to be um, expanding. Uh, and in Cuba, um, uh, given its uh, history and political system, it also uh, has an interest in understanding what the total economic impact is of the newer technology. So um, all countries are pointing the direction of requiring a budget impact analysis, but um, South Africa has not included that um, at all in the pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Um, and as we, we near to the, the completion of, of this webinar, it's useful to reflect on um, some research that was done by Gavaza, uh, Rascati and, and other colleagues, um, a paper that was published in the uh, journal of Pharmacoeconomics, uh, a publication um, with the title of the State of Health Economic Research in South Africa Systematic Review. And they reviewed 108 peer-reviewed studies that were published on uh, using health economic methods on South Africa. Um, and they identified that over a 20-year period, if I remember correctly, they found 108. And their recommendations uh, was that um, measures are needed to promote the commissioning of more and better quality health economic and pharmacoeconomic um, studies in, in South Africa. And I think there, there's a, a real opportunity here to focus on the, the capacity building at the level of um, health insurance companies, medical schemes, to be able to understand um, the the results that are produced in pharmacoeconomic studies, also at the, the level of the Department of Health to improve the, the, the capacity to receive the submissions, but then also to um, fairly and accurately evaluate the, the content of, of those submissions. Um, and the results of this study here suggest that um, half of the articles on health economics in South Africa are, are good quality and, and I think there, there's a real opportunity here through um, health education firms, um, through universities, uh, through uh, independent companies, um, uh, through local eSports South Africa chapters for example to uh, improve the, the level of capacity around the interpretation of pharmacoeconomic studies. What these uh, researchers did is they ranked the quality of articles on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, based on where the article was published inside or outside South Africa, country of residence of the primary author in economic analysis, primary training of the, the author, and they found that South Africa in blue compared to international um, publications were, were significantly different, um, statistically different. Um, and if you're interested in reviewing a copy of the, the publication, um, I'm happy to provide you a link of where that's available on, on the Pharmacoeconomics uh, webpage, and are you happy to um, I'd be more than happy to share that uh, information with you, um, as I said. So there's a real opportunity here of, of improving the, uh, the capacity and the interpretation of the pharmacoeconomic studies. So we're back at the, the conclusion. And um, just to review this uh, very briefly, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, is that the pharmacoeconomic guidelines differ in important areas, uh, and I've identified those areas. Um, given these differences, um, I believe that it's... Uh, what the pharmacoeconomic guidelines state is that there's an interest in determining whether medicine represents fair value for money. And I don't think at the moment that given what has been written into the pharmacoeconomic guidelines that this uh, statement is immediately achievable only because we don't have a societal perspective inside the pharmacoeconomic guidelines in South Africa. South Africa's guidelines don't incentivize complex and transparent models. Uh, South Africa's guidelines does not in integrate uh, equity issues, um, and there's a conflict between national health insurance policy and the pharmacoeconomic guidelines, um, and this is discussed in the, the paper. Um, the guidelines at the moment don't incentivize health insurance companies to disclose reimbursement data. Uh, they don't require the inclusion of budget impact analysis, and uh, there hasn't been any research, to my knowledge, on the impact of making the pharmacoeconomic submissions mandatory. So given that these are are gaps and potential uh, good areas for further work in the future that could be integrated in into version 2.0 uh, of South Africa's pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Once these are done, I believe that um, South African society and the healthcare system will be in a much better position to answer this question is, does a medicine 
um, for uh, prostate cancer, for, his, uh, for instance, represent fair value for money in South Africa and should it be reimbursed, both covering the private sector but then also the public sector. And um, I fully acknowledge that there, there are differences between the either sector, but this societal perspective that is discussed here um, takes into account both uh, segments of the population, both private uh, and public. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this research only answers what the differences are. It partially addresses why these differences exist, so the quality gaps and that the um, uh, structural focus is only on the private sector, but it has not answered um, how these differences came about. And, and this is um, something that CNC will be pursuing in the, the future, not part of a, of a witch hunt, but rather to better understand how policy is developed and how uh, issues such as conflicts of interest arise and how that results in um, bias that may shape uh, um, how pharmacoeconomic guidelines are developed. And a very practical example is um, an individual or group of individuals that work for medical schemes, uh, that work also for the government, that also work for pharmaceutical companies, that also run private consulting companies. I think there's a really real opportunity of potential conflicts of interest in trying to um, uh, work with so many different parties within South African economy that the potential to have a biased perspective and have that introduced into the development of pharmacoeconomic guidelines is very real. Um, in drafting further updates, um, um, our hope and, and my hope is that that process of managing potential conflicts of interest is made transparent and, and better understood. Another good example is uh, members of the, the pricing committee, for instance, um, do we understand and have a firm knowledge of whether they are independent consultants, whether they're currently working for medical schemes, whether they work at academia, and if so, if they are advising medical schemes and medical scheme administrators and they're receiving pharmacoeconomic submission for manufacturers, I think there's a real potential conflict of interest right there. Um, in having that person or group of individuals to uh, evaluate pharmacoeconomic submissions independently. So conflicts of interest is, is a, a potential um, area that may arise in studying um, how these differences came about. Um, another area is the good technical governance and due diligence. Um, it appears that in the drafting of the pharmacoeconomic guidelines that there were two major sources that, that were used, the, the Irish pharmacoeconomic guidelines and the Australian pharmacoeconomic guidelines. Um, it doesn't um, appear uh, to our knowledge that there was a robust um, uh, international review done of how pharmacoeconomic guidelines are structured around the world to then use best practice from those countries and to implement it within the South African environment. And that I think is, is part of the due diligence process that um, as part of the, the pricing committee, um, my personal view is uh, I think they have failed in their responsibility to follow this process of, of due diligence uh, of international review and following a good pro a process of good technical governance to ensure that it's consultative, uh, to ensure that um, we understand who the drafters are, uh, that we understand how potential conflicts of, of interest have been managed. And the other refers to private versus um, public conversations and the, the issue of leadership. Um, uh, CNC and, and I, I engage uh, on a daily basis uh, with several colleagues and um, stakeholders and clients in South Africa. There are many private conversations that, that take place um, around the pharmacoeconomic guidelines uh, and personal opinions. So what um, I would like to personally see um, is that a lot of those private conversations be documented and placed into the public domain. Um, and as um, uh, for, for lack of a better um, uh, idiom or phrase is to nail your colors to the, the mast and publicly state what your views are with respect to the pharmacoeconomic guidelines and how they could be developed. And, and um, um, I think this is, is a topic of leadership, um, something that uh, could be pursued by ISPO South Africa chapter, for instance. Uh, they're already in the process of setting up a, a great panel conversation next week. Um, I'll be part of that uh, panel conversation via video link. And I think what, what that panel conversation does and what this webinar does and moves a lot of these private conversations that take place 
um, and changes of opinion that usually happens uh, from one party to, to the other and moves a lot of this debate out into the public domain so that we can have a frank open conversation around how the guidelines could be potentially improved in the, the future, what are the, the next steps in taking us in, in that direction um, and how can we jointly manage uh, this process to deliver a better value for South African patients uh, but then also to ensure that the, the value of newer technologies that are being introduced into to South Africa are being appropriately evaluated and appropriately reimbursed. Um, I think there's a real opportunity there to do some great work in the, the future in this area. So thanks so much for, for connecting. Um, I really appreciate your, your time. Um, uh, the, this presentation has been about uh, 27 minutes, um, 28 minutes. Um, if you need to contact um, us, uh, we're available on our webpage. A recording of this uh, webinar will be provided um, on our site a little bit later on. We will, uh, either myself or Teresa, will be sending out an email um, to your inbox with a link of this uh, uh, with a recording of this webinar if you'd like to replay it or to review certain content. Uh, but then we're also available on our direct lines either in Boston, Johannesburg on the 087 number um, or if you happen to be traveling in Manama, Bahrain or in uh, York, uh, the UK. So thanks so much uh, again for connecting and um, I appreciate your, your time.